Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'd like to welcome you to our Thought Leadership webinar, Our Engineers, the Superheroes of Today's Industrial Future. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and the waterways on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Siemens. Siemens is a global technology powerhouse that started its Australian operations in 1872, celebrating their 150th anniversary this year and their 175th anniversary globally. Today, Siemens brings together the digital and physical worlds to benefit customers and society. Active around the world, the company focuses on industry, infrastructure, mobility and healthcare. I'm now pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Barbara Humpton, CEO and President of Siemens US. Ms Humpton is in Australia as a representative of the US industry and at the request of the Australian Prime Minister to support the Sydney Energy Forum. The forum aims to develop and secure critical clean energy supply chains for the fast growing Indo-Pacific region an agreed outcome of the Quad Countries Alliance between the USA, Australia, India and Japan. A qualified mathematician, Barbara has become an influential global leader whose knowledge and experience is both deep and wide across a range of important technology areas, including infrastructure and industry, and is a passionate voice for industry in the US. I would also like to introduce Keith Ritchie, Keith is the Head of Communications and Government Affairs for Siemens Australia and the Pacific region. He has been instrumental in driving thought leadership in the country in areas such as green hydrogen, digitalisation and Industry 4.0 narrative in Australia, including his role in establishing the Prime Minister's Industry 4.0 Task Force. Please welcome Barbara Humpton and Keith Ritchie. Thanks Romilly and uh, welcome Barbara, thanks for joining us. And and please uh, welcome to everyone joining this webinar today. Uh, we have uh, a lot of people online and it's fantastic that we've got this level of engagement with you. And uh, Barbara, before we go into the topic, I noticed on LinkedIn that you were with President Biden on stage somewhere in the last week or two in your international travels. What was that about? Oh, actually, what a thrill. Um, when the president gave the State of the Union address earlier this year, uh, what we had shared with his team is the fact that Siemens is making an investment in the electric vehicle charging infrastructure of the US. $54 million being uh, put into a couple of manufacturing locations, Grand Prairie, Texas, Pomona, California. And then we've actually made the commitment to manufacture a million EV chargers over the next four years. It's absolutely aligned with our national priorities. And the president's team invited me to actually make the announcement from the stage at the White House. What a thrill. That's fantastic. Yeah, you must have a lot of those sort of moments that you just look back and say, wow. This, actually, I will tell you this about uh, being able to, first of all, to be with Siemens. Second, to serve as the CEO for Siemens USA, our largest market in the world. This is an incredible platform, and now is the time. With, with the whole world in transformation, the kinds of things that we at Siemens can do in electrification, automation, digitalization, it means we're relevant to what's happening in the world. So the topic for today, I mean, it was a pretty catchy headline about engineers being superheroes of the industrial future. Yeah. What do you mean by that? What, why, why would engineers be superheroes of the industrial well, future? Well, I mean, what do you think a superhero is? We all have grown up with our own superheroes and they're the, they're the intergalactic defenders. They're the people who are changing the world and, and, and protecting us, preparing us for the future. So it, the fact is the things that we're worried about today, whether we're worried about climate change or the effects of urbanization, whether we're thinking about the aging demographics of people everywhere, it turns out that it's engineers were working with technologies that are giving us the tools we need to prepare for that future. They are our defenders. And there's a bit of a play on the whole uh, DC Comics Marvel thing with the Omniverse and the, the industrial metaverse and um, we're going to talk about that a bit later. You've also got your own podcast. What's it called? Oh, I have a podcast called The Optimistic Outlook. And what makes you optimistic? I mean, we've had 
let's face it, the last two years have not been the easiest two years around the planet. Yeah. We've got, uh, you know, war in the Ukraine, we've, we've had pandemics, we've got all sorts of challenges. What are you optimistic about? Well, first of all, we should pause for just a minute and think about optimism. What is optimism? Is optimism rose-colored glasses? No. Optimism is a deep-seated feeling that we're going to be okay. We have the tools we need to meet the moment. And, and I've never been more optimistic than I am right now because despite all the disruption, I, there was a chief engineer on a project I worked on very early in my career, and there was an organization change at one point. And I remember having this conversation with my chief engineer saying, oh, you know, all this disruption and this is unsettling and everything. And he said, wait, think about it. It's times of disruption that give you the opportunity to shape things the way you want them to be. It's in moments when there's disruption that everybody says, oh, the old way of doing things isn't going to work for us now. And so when things ungel in that moment and you think very quickly, hey, how would I rearrange things? What would I set up differently so that later when things are gelled and we have a new, this is the way we do things now, it's aligned with what you want. It's aligned with the outcomes you know are going to be healthier for everyone. That's what I'm excited about right now. Because whether it was pandemic, whether it was economic disruption, whether it's social unrest, as heartbreaking as it is, whether mm. it's war, these are things that make us stop and think about how should we go forward. And, and we at Siemens have been turning our attention to the tools that we know we can bring to the table to help solve the world's biggest problems. So speaking of that, in the US, I mean, you guys do a lot of great stuff. Have you got any favorites that you can highlight? Well, this has been one of the fun things about the Optimistic Outlook podcast itself, and I'd encourage all of you to tune in. You know, think 25-minute segments dealing with, actually, infrastructure. And so I've talked to innovators in the U.S. who are doing things like bringing new business models, a company in California named Ampli, uh, bringing a new business model that disintermediates the cost of electricity so that managers of large bus fleets can actually run their operations in a very predictable way. Or think about the disruption that's happening in the semiconductor industry today. We ran a three episode series talking about, hey, here are the things that we can do. These are the things that are in our control. And I've been so proud of my colleagues at Siemens uh, in smart infrastructure who are doing things like bringing power to the new semiconductor operations. So you name it, whether we're looking into the building infrastructure, whether you're looking into the transformation of manufacturing that's happening in the US, whether it's the new forms of transportation with our train makers. By the way, Joe Biden, they call him Amtrak Joe. You know, he's a, he's a big train fan. Uh, what I'm, I'm really proud of is that we've got innovators across the board working in all of these areas. And engineers are in the thick of it. So Engineers Australia has about 120,000 engineer members. And um, I guess they're at the sweet spot at the moment. Well, if you think about it, no, none of the good stuff is happening unless we have engineers engaged. Yeah. Uh, the, we, we are now in a phase in history when we're bringing new technologies to the table, and it's only engineers who can think through those systems, can understand how things will interact, and who will help map, map out and chart out that future for us. In fact, I think the biggest problem right now is we don't have enough engineers. Yeah. I'm hearing this as we sit down at the infrastructure table, and the US is going to spend billions and billions of dollars on infrastructure, and everyone is looking for the talent to help them move forward. Yeah, we, we've got the same problem here in Australia. Big infrastructure investments, lots of announcements, and not enough qualified people to actually deliver on them. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that you talked about are really about accelerating change, and, and especially during those times uh, that are a little bit more difficult. And Siemens recently launched something along that line called Accelerator. Can yeah. you tell us a bit about Accelerator? Yeah, I, let's, let's get into this and unpack it, because I have a feeling this is where you're going to bring me back to the industrial metaverse. Um, accelerator. In simple terms, this is our open digital business platform. 
And everybody says, why are you saying that so slowly, Barb? Well, it's because each word matters. Siemens is a company that's been at the forefront of inventing many new technologies. And we're recognizing in this moment the importance of being open, being able to interoperate with others' capabilities. Uh, the idea of being flexible. We, if we can build physical objects that are software driven, it means that we have the ability to help those tools and, and, and devices that we're using evolve with us as new capabilities emerge. Bringing all of that together into a business platform so that customers can easily find us and doing business with us is easier, that's what the Siemens Accelerator is all about. And so we, why, why don't we just do this by ourselves? I mean, you mentioned that there's other partners. How does that work? What, surely we're big enough and ugly enough and 350,000 people and we're the largest industrial software company in the world. Surely we can do everything required you know, Keith, I'm sitting here and I'm, we've got this backdrop behind us that is showing 150 proud years in Australia. And you can see all the many building blocks that the Team Siemens in Australia brings to the table. But what you also know, if you've ever served in any of these roles, is that you go into just about any environment, whether it's infrastructure, industry, transportation, and it's what we think of as a brownfield environment. It, there's, there's existing technology all around us. So, no, Siemens doesn't do everything end to end. We bring leading edge technology into the game, but it's important that we operate within an ecosystem. So Accelerator actually focuses on three independent pieces. One is that ecosystem. Who are the partners we should be working with so that we're solving our customers' most fundamental problems? But second, What's the portfolio we're bringing to the table? And the third is, how do we offer that up in a marketplace? And so as time goes on, we'll be able to introduce everyone to the actual marketplace. They can browse around, and actually, we're looking for feedback and input. So I'm hoping that we'll hear from engineers all around the world uh, about the, the new launch that we've put out there. We were talking a little bit before about competitiveness and who is our competitor versus who is our partner. That's an interesting topic. I say get the word competitor out of our language completely. Right? Yes, there are a lot of people innovating in the space we work in. I mean, let's ask ourselves, how many building technologies experts are there in the world? It turns out there are a handful. And, and we have classically thought of, uh, of these peers of ours in the marketplace as competitors. But the transformation we're in right now, building a more sustainable world, addressing the effects of climate change, means there's more work to be done right now than all of us put together could accomplish. So what I'm challenging us all to think about is get the word competitor out of our language and ask, yes, we have to we have to challenge each other in the marketplace. We have to you know, drive for lower prices, better quality service, et cetera, et cetera. But are there places where we can bring our capabilities side by side and drive to satisfy a greater need? And if we think that way, what we're going to do is drive more win-win situations. I, my favorite thing to remind people of is there is no such thing as a win-lose. Lose-lose is possible, but we're trying to drive win-win-win-win-win. Yeah. I, I saw already that there's over 50 partners uh, signed up to be part of this marketplace and it's, it's kind of the usual suspects of Amazon Web Services and Microsoft and SAP and Accenture, but there's a lot more than that. It's, it's really quite an open system. Large and small. And the, the big names, the big brands that everybody will recognize, why well, Amazon Web Services? Well, of course, they're a hosting partner for so many things we do, and we're working together and, and innovating together. Same thing with Microsoft. Same thing with SAP. A lot of our customers are living in worlds where in the past, they've had to choose. Do I, do I pick the SAP solution for excellence in finance or do I pick the Siemens solution for excellence in engineering? Hey, we want to solve that problem for customers everywhere. And by becoming ecosystem partners this way, we'll be working together to solve it. And then there are plenty of small providers where there may be a player who has a niche solution. And what we're finding is that if we can give that player access to the Siemens portfolio of customers, the, 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 the Siemens market uh, presence actually can take what is maybe today a small and boutique idea and now expand it into world-changing uh, uh, proportions. In, in fact, something that uh, we haven't talked about is the fact that Fast Company Magazine 
named Siemens World Changing Company of the Year this year. Okay. And it's it's a an honor they've only granted four times. And and so and you ask yourself what made what made Siemens stand out amongst a whole world of tech companies? And the answer is just this. We're working on the things that really matter. And we have the reach to be able to take innovations to global scale very rapidly. And I guess there's a lot of uh, reinvention that, that happens. Uh, certainly with the 150 years, we came into the country um, with the Overland Telegraph uh, project from Darwin to Adelaide. And we're not selling Overland Telegraphs for some reason anymore. Uh, so obviously the, the way the company changes over time and, and Siemens AG is 175 years old. So this, this is kind of an evolution. It is an evolution. And where are we going next, Keith? We've got to come back to the industrial metaverse because uh, we've been hearing a lot about the metaverse these days. And we know that those in the social media field have been building tools and those in the gaming industry have been creating worlds for us. And, and we now are at a moment when we can bring all of those technologies, the, the communications power that we found in the iPhone, along with the, the ability to animate and create photorealism, all of these tools that others have brought to the table, now Siemens can come into the picture and say with our physics, with our ability to simulate the physical world, we're now able to deliver what we've dubbed the industrial metaverse. Folks say, well, I know why I'd wanna go play a video game. Why would I want a metaverse for my industrial setting? Well, think about the possibilities. There's a chance here to actually be running a real-time digital twin of a manufacturing environment. So this is an evolution of the digital twin. As we the know digital it. twin that we've been working on, you've been sharing yeah. here in Australia, I've been talking about in the United States for a decade. Yeah. Um, that idea that we begin from the moment of ideation and we create a digital representation of something, yeah. a product or a production line, maybe the operations of something. Now we follow that through, we create a digital thread as we follow that through its life cycle. Here we have the ability to be simulating the entire, the, the thing in its production environment, maybe in its operational environment, and then be able to do what if scenarios in almost real time. Being able to anticipate what's coming, fast forward into the future, or even rewind into the past to understand a failure that happened. So we announced this uh, partnership with NVIDIA Omniverse. Yes. Given that we've got all this experience in Digital Twin, uh, you know, NASA and JPL use our technology to create a Digital Twin f so that they can successfully land the Mars rover. Yes. Why did we partner with um, NVIDIA Omniverse and their Omniverse? Yeah, well, so Siemens and NVIDIA, I had the chance to talk to our global CEO, Roland Bush, about this just recently. Um, and he had first um, sat down with NVIDIA and the leadership there to talk about what we might do as partners. And there was a strong sense at NVIDIA that the tools they've been developing for photorealistic, uh, they, they think of it in terms of simulation. Yeah. But, but what we bring to the table, as I say, are the digital twin and digital thread. The physics. The physics, the science behind it, so yeah. that it, this becomes way more than an animation, it becomes a true simulation. The challenge was, let's grab a real world project and see what happens. And what they did is they worked with BMW. Okay. And they actually um, created a, the industrial metaverse version of a BMW manufacturing line and in within a short time, I think in less than six months, the team had this thing up and running and everyone was stunned. Keith, the thing I'm most excited about though is not the fact that, hey, in six months this was stood up and we were able to announce it. In fact, by the way, go to YouTube, just Google or look up in YouTube the um, Siemens NVIDIA, and you'll see a fantastic overview video. It won't take you long to look at it, but it'll give you that, that image, that mental image of so what we, this So we've is. seen digital twins before. What's it look like compared to a normal 
Siemens Digital Twin? Well, in a Siemens tool, if you're using, say, Siemens um, Solid Edge, I'll just you know pick a simple yeah, one, yeah. right? In order to uh, work, to support your design efforts, you might find what uh, our our leaders call the cotton candy color version of the. You know, we've got there's color differentials so that you can make out the various parts and you know the fact that they are separate elements of an overall design. Here with the industrial metaverse, we're seeing a photorealistic um, a, a visualization of the actual product as it will perform. And so, you know, so all it looks of like the you're effects, really there. It, it's in fact, there are people who have seen these kinds of things and what they're imagining, what, what they believe they're seeing actually is a is a prototype. Actual video. A, a physical prototype of yeah. something that's to be built, not yeah. recognizing that, okay. no, 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 this is in design form and we're ready to go pull the trigger. But the great news about these tools is we're using all of this technology to help us envision and perfect designs before we ever begin to create things in the physical world. Okay, so the technology is evolving. Back to the engineers. Yeah. And I get now the whole superhero theme. Yeah. They're, they're solving the big problems of the world. And there's a bit of a play on the whole DC, Marvel, omniverse, universe, yeah. metaverse. But what does it mean to the job of an engineer? How does that look different? Paint, paint me that picture. And are there any examples in the US that you can call on? Uh, well, it, we actually are installing these tools into the, the US has a whole family of manufacturing institutes. And so we've been installing these tools into those places so, so people can come and actually envision. And so when we think about customers, you mentioned NASA already, and, mm. and the, NASA's completely in now. So as they're going forward with new families and new generations of, of um, future missions, our tools are there. And likewise, the Department of Defense. Uh, the Air Force decided to um, actually standardize on Siemens technology for this life cycle management of the future platforms, planes, and such that so they're the building. So the U.S. Air Force? The United States Air Force, wow. as well as the Navy, have both stepped forward and, and made okay. the selection of the Siemens tool suites. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we think that's brilliant because once, once you do this, then now you have the ability to communicate across the entire life. What do the tools look like? Now that we're adding these new aspects of it, I wonder whether the engineers of the future are going to feel more like they're coming to work playing video games, right? I think we're headed into a realm where the skill that we want our kids to focus on is video games. So you're, you're telling me that I should have been telling my teenage son, it's okay to spend your whole life playing video games. Yes, I, uh, let me tell you a story about Lisa Atherton, CEO of Textron Aviation. She has, I went to see her a couple of years ago, her son was 11 years old. Uh, she said that she was in a meeting, uh, working from home that day, she was in a meeting, uh, talking to her engineering team about what tools they needed to be adopting as they evolve their operations. They're thinking about ERP systems, they're thinking about manufacturing systems. And her son comes in, mom, mom, and, sorry, I, I, can't be, I can't be interrupted. Mom, mom, I wanna show you something. When she finally was able to go and see what he was doing, he was playing Minecraft with his <laughs> friends. And he said, hey, I just created a new uh, metal that is gonna be used to create a new weapon that we need in order to defend ourselves against this other team we're playing against. She, she looked at him and, and said, he is playing with the tools that in my engineering world, we can't even begin to dream of. And so this is where Siemens and NVIDIA together are actually bringing that into the very serious world of what ultimately will be the engineering behind everything from aerospace to cosmetics to the FDA. Today, the FDA in the US has, has actually partnered with Siemens so that we can do digital twins of new either devices or treatments that are in development and they can actually, instead of passing paper back and forth in these long documentation exercises for approval, they can actually play with the digital twin. And we can be doing things in parallel so that we shorten the time to speed new capabilities to market. So what you're telling me is that the, um, the engineers of old recognized globally for their brown cardigans and their propellers and all of those things that we consider a little bit uncool are actually cool now. And they're really where you should, you know, the jobs of the future 
where you should focus they, your career. They are absolutely cool, but okay. let me but let me tell you, and there are a lot of people who've been hanging out in, you know, I don't know, dreadlocks, who've been <laughs> tie-dyed t-shirts, people who've, yeah, been buttoned up in suits. All of those folks can now find their way into the engineering profession because it's not about graph paper and slide rolls. It's more accessible. Think about what it used to take to be productive in an engineering environment. You needed the full engineering education and the yeah. proven experience. We still need people who do yeah. that. We need the people who are going to be doing the, the basic research in engineering, but we now have tools where we can encapsulate that know-how so that someone who just wants to be able to say, hey, referencing all of the laws of physics, here's my goal, create a new part for a motorcycle that somebody named Keith Ritchie might ultimately be interested in buying. That sounds good. <laughs> Maybe I need to study up on my low-code, uh, no-code software. The future will bring this right to you. So, Barbara, uh, you've had a pretty amazing career, and I think you started as a mathematician or qualified in mathematics, and you come from a family of, of mathematicians. Setting out now, a young engineer comes to you and asks for a piece of advice about their future and their career, what's that one piece of advice that you're gonna give them? Well, I, I'll be honest, the first thing I always start with is know yourself and find out what really makes you tick and then make sure you follow that no matter what. For me, what I didn't know when I was studying mathematics is that I was learning how to solve problems. What I discovered in the early part of my career is that I'm passionate about working with very large teams. The, more the bigger, the more complex, the better to solve really big problems. So this world that we're in is you know, an unending supply of great challenges. Yeah. But, but for people who are thinking about, well, what do I have to study? What grades do I have to get? You know, what school do I have to go to? I say set that worry aside. Our careers are gonna last 30, 40, 50 years. And what you might learn at a university today will be relevant, for sure, for a while. But you have to get ready for a world in which you're constantly learning. Things are constantly changing. And so what I hope young people are doing, people starting their careers today, I hope they're just igniting their curiosity. I hope they're igniting their passion for topics that are gonna yield uh, that, that, uh, the propulsion that gets them in through many, many stages of a very long and fruitful career. So the learning, unfortunately, for those who just graduated from engineering, it's lifelong learning. It it's doesn't just stop. begun. Okay. Yeah, well, all you've done is you've learned how to learn. Yeah. Now, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, growth mindset, I guess, is a topic that Siemens often refers to and that that, um, how would you describe that? Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because in two words, it encapsulates so much. Um, the work of Carol Dweck uh, introduced us and really brought together the concepts of growth mindset. Growth mindset says we understand that we are becoming and it is a belief that we can change and learn and adapt so that so that we can be successful as we as we move forward and so people with a fixed mindset tend to think that oh you know i am this way and always will be oh keith is the way he is and always will be a growth mindset says i know we're both evolving and so we have the ability to then direct which way we grow so there's hope for me yet Oh, Keith, I, I am confident <laughs> that you already were, you were born with a growth mindset. Thank you. Um, so we've got a, a little bit of time for some questions from the um, audience. Great. I'll just have a look at one that's come in from Troy from Victoria. Do you feel that innovation will be driven via human intelligence, artificial intelligence or both? And will systems engineers be the next big engineering requirement? Oh, well, I mean, systems engineers have always been <laughs> an important requirement. But a lot of people have been nervous about artificial intelligence and whether that's actually sort of coming to take over the world. But, but my perspective is that from the first time a human picked up a rock and used it as a tool, tools have elevated the role of the human. And, and, and it's no difference now with machine learning, artificial intelligence, we have the ability today for human intelligence 
to help to point where we put these precious resources and, and really get the artificial intelligence aiming in the right direction. Systems engineers are key to making it successful. Okay. And uh, we've got another question from George in the US. So he must be one of our engineer members that's uh, from the US. What are your thoughts about accelerating digitalization in the construction industry? Now, that's, that's an interesting one because I was um, listening to one of your podcasts uh, earlier. You spoke to Richard Kennedy, the president and CEO of Skanska, and uh, this seems to be on topic. This is such a great question because right now we're focused on the digitalization of everything. I, I always like to say Siemens works on the internet of really big things. And, and buildings are one of those really big things. And oh, not just buildings when it comes to infrastructure. And digital tools coming to the table are gonna be a game changer. I, what Richard and I got a chance to talk about, and I hope people will tune in and, and uh, have a chance to see the episode. Uh, we talked about how that transformation is coming to construction. Look for it everywhere. So construction industry is, um I, I hear it's a little bit behind the um, manufacturing industry when it comes to things like Industry 4.0 and digitalization. Is that true, and why do you think that is? Um, well, it, true in some sense, um, but but in construction, we're seeing the advent of the digital twin, people using a digital twin of a building. Siemens just introduced Building X, so that we have you know, there's these digital tools that will help us manage building operations. Likewise, Siemens has reached out, and, and we've been looking for startups and, and young companies that we might be able to bring into the corporation. Recent acquisitions have included a building digital twin uh, that could actually help during the construction phase. So uh, yeah, so the, the tools exist, but just like in manufacturing, everyone is just beginning to explore how to use them. Excellent. Well, we've got one more question here, uh, and this will be our final question. Clinton from Queensland. Barbara, do you see a need for governments to work harder towards net zero? Uh, this is such a great question because this is the whole reason that I'm in Australia. The Sydney Energy Forum is a gathering of stakeholders in government, in business, and in non-government organizations working on just this question. We know that we need more resilience in our energy supply chains. And who's in a position to influence that and, and help us achieve our goals? Turns out business can't do it alone because business has to operate within a regulatory environment. It turns out government can't do it alone because while they have the ability to create regulations and frameworks, incentives, et cetera, they don't have all the tools they need to actually implement. No, it's gonna need, this is gonna take all of us. And so I'm really actually encouraged by what I've been hearing, the spirit of collaboration uh, with everything, as simple as a country setting a goal which becomes a target for businesses to work toward, that's, that's powerful. But you know, when we actually think about how do we incentivize investments in the US in um, building the electric vehicle charging infrastructure will encourage the uptake of EVs. You look to your left and your right and we'll see lots of examples of these kinds of things. Sounds like a really holistic solution is needed to achieve net zero. It's not, it's not um, a magic pill. I am looking for magic everywhere, but instead what I see is good engineering work. Let's get to it. Excellent. Barbara, that's, that's all we've got time for. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure having you here. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation myself. I hope the engineers who have joined us today also thoroughly enjoy the conversation and we look forward to lots of feedback and it's fantastic to have you in Australia. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thank you, Keith.